But it's like, if you think of like calm or headspace, like an immersive thing you listen to with headphones and to calm you down and stuff like, it's like that, but you're listening to sex stories. It was like, something's fucking up and I know it. And it was like a weight on your shoulder of like an invisible enemy. And I've got notes in my phone for when I was going through depressive episodes. I was like, why am I always back here? No matter what I do, I eat healthy, I train, I do this, I go for runs, I try and do this, make these changes, but I always end up back here. Why? And then it was when I got diagnosed, I was like, that makes fucking sense now. <laughs> you it. it is fucking terrifying to look in the mirror and be like, who are you without this like substance to mask it for me? And he got me in a clinch and kneed me in the nose three times in a row. I didn't even stop it. I, was, I had my hands there and it just comes straight up. Kneed me in the nose three times. I'm pretty sure it fractured my nose. Uh, blood everywhere. I went for a takedown, got like manhandled and he used literally ground and pounded me for about a minute just blood yeah. everywhere. And like, I was at school at the time, so I was like bragging around thinking I was a bollocks. Like, yeah, I'm an MMA fighter. Next thing you know, a week, like a month later on YouTube, there's me just getting <laughs> weighed in. So it was like really humbling. I spent all that time as trying to build this identity of being a fighter, physical. Whereas actually, if I look back at all my life now, metaphorically, I've always been a fighter through resilience of other stuff and life challenges. Welcome back to the Everyday Perspective podcast. Please like this video and subscribe to our channel for our weekly content. Today's guest is a BJJ Purple Belt. He is a mental health advocate and he is also a saucy voice <laughs> actor. <laughs> Ryan Mares. Ryan, how are you, mate? Good to see you, boys. Thank you for having me. I'm good. Uh, good, mate. Thanks for making this trip down. So uh, come down from London today, mate, to do this. So appreciate uh, yeah, the effort coming down, mate. So we'll, we'll go for a few bits, mate. Obviously, um, I kind of learned a little bit about your latest ventures and some of the work you do uh, with that sexy voice of yours, which we'll definitely come on to in a bit. <laughs> <laughs> He's essentially an audio porn star. Who knew that was even a thing? Bit different, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I don't even know what to so, say. Uh, <laughs> so hands above the uh, on the table, mate, throughout this podcast as he's talking, all right? Yeah, all right. So when I met you through jiu-jitsu, um, I think you were in recruitment hiring people to sell burgers, not McDonald's, <laughs> but doing, you know, a, a city job of sorts. Yeah. And then I think since that time, you've now moved in a completely different direction. Um, and I think the last time I, I saw you in person, potentially you were talking to me about the fact that you're just going all in on this venture. Um, at the time, you didn't really elaborate too much on what it was. You you, you came across a bit edgy, actually. So you could tell you're like, <laughs> fuck, like, fucking I'm taking a jump in the fucking darkness here. But it sounds like it's gone all right. <laughs> so tell us about what the fuck is yeah. <laughs> tell us about like that tell us about being like self-employed and like what's sort of well and that's been over the last sort of six months or so for you yeah so it's definitely been like like I said the last year six months been crazy shift in, in life I used to be a recruitment and employer brand manager a career and then um, yeah last Christmas the Christmas before like so over a year ago I started making like TikToks just as a bit of entertainment for myself. As I say, I've always been a bit of a social media fiend. So I was just making like little jokey sketches about like dating and just like all that kind of typical TikTok stuff. And then weirdly, um, content started getting served to a female audience and they took an interest in my voice. And they would kind of start asking me to do quotes and say stuff and I'd say it. And then for some reason it would just go viral. And then I'd gain like, I was just gaining lots and lots of like TikTok followers and uh, a certain niche audience. And then, yeah, like I started getting um, approached by, they're called, it's called Audio Erotica, um, which, yeah, it is essentially audio porn. Um, and the only way I can describe it for the, like the app that I work for, it's called Quinn. I'm like a freelancer for them, is like, um, it's predominantly, like I say, a female audience. But it's like, if you think of like calm or headspace, like an immersive thing you listen to with headphones and to calm you down and stuff like, it's like that, but you're listening to sex stories <laughs> and uh, it's my job. So to, you just read them? Yeah, I like act them, yeah. So it's the full, yeah, he, the, the double blink gave it away. <laughs> <laughs> you, you need to be clear when you say you act them though. So yeah, so I, I uh, like voice act them, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not on the moment, like <laughs> just narrating. Narrate it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so it involves, yeah, it's, like, it's very niche. It's, it's predominantly like been big in America over the last like couple of years, but it's starting to, I've got a bit of a, a UK audience as well. 
but it's like a safe space for because obviously as as men you know everyone's a sexual being but you men typically watch porn and you know women watch porn but typically they there's like a, the audio element to it is actually like what is like their what they enjoy so it's like an immersive experience it's, it's a safe space like the the it's like ethical and and stuff like that so it's it's definitely different. I definitely understand why everyone has raised eyebrows and stuff. But yeah, it's it's something that I had to, I have like leaned into more so over the last month because at the time I was very coy as when you saw me. Um, I wasn't really posting about it much. But once you see that like people value and appreciate your work and they enjoy it, that's all you want to do as people. Like you want people to, whatever you do, you want people to appreciate your craft. And although mine's niche and different and co to some people controversial, it's like, I enjoy <laughs> it. It's making people happy. Let me fucking be. <laughs> so it's, it's- Do you, you earn good money out of it? Pardon? Is it good money? It's, yeah, it's, com yeah, yeah, it's comfortable. It's comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> that, mean, that means it's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's like, it's niche and yeah, it's going to be interesting over the next, like, as, it, as my following grows and community grows, it's like, but predominantly positive. It's, but from a male perspective, like I was like, obviously people are gonna, there was one TikTok that went viral and everyone was like, what the fuck are you doing, mate? <laughs> <laughs> but you kind of have to expect that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, have, you got, have you got like a, a like an online name yet? Well, I, my, I go by my nickname, Mersey. That's always been like my, well, over the last like two years been my persona online. I just kind of run with that. Mm. Um, but yeah, like some people, cause it is, it's, it's, a, it's a very like, in, vulnerable thing. So some people are like anonymous on the platforms. Some people are like me where they're quite open with it. Mm. Um, and my whole brand, I was actually talking about this on the train up today, like my whole brand is like about transparency and wellness. Mm. And I was like, how can I, I can understand why people want to be anonymous and like their own different career paths. And it's like their, their side hustle and anonymity is always very important for safety and stuff. But for me, like my brand, personal brands, transparency and wellness. I talk about breaking stigmas and men's mental health and stuff. And it's like, well, yeah, sexual wellness is still on that umbrella. I'm helping men and women with two different sides of my coin, which is helpful, <laughs> but um, I've got to own it as well. And that's going to come with repercussions and people are going to take the piss. And I'm still waiting for a big burst of hate, but fuck them. Know, mate. <laughs> All I'm saying, thinking about now is next time I see like a woman with headphones on, <laughs> smiling. <laughs> I'm just never going to think the same thing again now. I'm going to think, I'll fuck be like, it. I'm not She's listening to Mersey. <laughs> yeah. But that's the thing. You, could, you couldn't walk around, could you, watching porn? Yeah. Like, but if you're into you know listening what, to fucking, it. Yeah. Fucking women love that as well. The horny fuckers, isn't they? They all love the fucking <laughs> Fifty Shades of fucking grey. And this that. is the, the fantasy. Like, I was a bit naive to like how big that community was and like yeah. that. And like huge, learning mate. women's needs and like the different ranges and like fantasy books and romance and it's been a good like education piece. Like I do consider myself like a feminist and stuff like, so it's like been really good and educational from that point of view to understand their perspectives. And then, um, yeah, it's just been bonkers six months, but it's, I'm, I'm, it's two different worlds to what I was doing, but I'm so much happier now. Mm. And like, as I say, you, no, we were talking about this earlier, like everyone's going to judge you no matter what you're doing. Even if you were doing, X and you got like a, I don't know if you if you even if you were like super successful and happy I don't, I don't know I don't consider this like the uh, uh, currency of like success and happiness but if you had like a nice car that everyone wanted if you bought a black car there's always gonna be someone that's like you should have got it in red mm -hmm. there's always gonna be someone yeah it's jealousy isn't it? it's envy jealousy exactly so yeah I'm just like learning to run with it and kind of link into the social media stuff for me now that like the big thing is is getting more comfortable with my own skin as I am it's gonna help me navigate when I do get those criticisms or if, if I get those criticisms and judgments and stuff but at the end of the day like fuck them yeah yeah definitely <laughs> simple as that yeah. isn't it? I'm curious as well do you, do you have you been asked or do you offer the service of doing like live <laughs> <laughs> like like sex talk. I feel like there's a woman out there that's heard your voice and gone, I'd love that guy, just give me a call. <laughs> just talk dirty to me. I feel that would be a big way. bank as well, mate. So I've had people like um, uh, reach out about it. So you know, for, for the app I work with, um, 
I only do like that or do that kind of type of content with them. I don't offer it like elsewhere, but I do have like um, a Patreon where like, it's like, I do like two podcasts a week, but I do like a, people fucking lose their heads about this because it's quite niche, but every Sunday night I do like a Zoom call with like my subscribers, okay. but it's like women from all around the world just chatting with me. And people are like, people pay to just join a Zoom with you on a Sunday night. I'm like, yeah. And we just chat. Like we just chat. I learn about like their, where they live in America or like around the world and just like have quite chat, like fun chats. But I think as like, if my platform grows and I, as I grow, that kind of accessibility is going to probably be harder to navigate. I think because you, if you do have like 50 people trying to join it, mm. but it's going to be harder to like, like the Gen Z event chat. Um, but like at the minute, there's like you know, a few people join every week. It's quite nice. Yeah. But it keeps you, that's the nice bit is because when you're so attached to, um, whether it's like people gassing you up on like comments, actually seeing and conversing with people like on a Zoom call, it's not quite face to face, but on a Zoom call or something, it is nice to people appreciate your work. Like, it's, it is a bit strange when they're like, I masturbate to you, but you're like, Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why don't you jump in with the OnlyFans, mate? <laughs> I, I've contemplated it many times, many times, and people have kind of pushed that to me. I had a, uh, on my Insta yesterday, someone recommended that I should be an escort, all this. So people <laughs> okay. want me in that world, but it, for me, like the part I enjoy is like the the voice acting, the creativity and the writing and the storytelling. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do you need, do you need a manager, mate? Do you need a manager? <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> get, you are one of Paul's like, Mark can make a bit of commission <laughs> off this guy. <laughs> nah, it's cool, man. And in addition to that, you do, uh, you do, you do some accents as well. Do accents, yeah. yeah. Impressions, yeah. 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 What ones? I'm near them, what ones? So the popular ones on TikTok are, well, there's one that's like a book character, which is more like the fantasy realm, which you guys probably won't know, but I do like uh, Tommy Shelby. Um, I don't know. Oh, there's that's quite a few. Did like Alfie Solomon's. I've done like a Peaky Blinders scene. I've done a Batman, a Joker scene. I'm just trying to expand on that as well. Um, so yeah, when I do like, when I say to people that like, cause my profession is like, I'm a voice artist and like content creator. It isn't just the audio erotica stuff. Like I do, try and branch out into other stuff yeah yeah are you able to uh give danny an example of your tommy shelby <laughs> oh, well, we, can, <laughs> we can look away no, no, went direct. Oh, <laughs> this is where my voice breaks though and if it's because i usually um i can do one i'll give it a go for the crowd <laughs> but, okay. um when i do the videos that people see like on the reels like they take me like so many takes because i'm trying to learn the script. Imagine, yeah. and it's like the voice <laughs> just sounds like the opposite and it's like embarrassing i but, think that's a reality of social media though isn't it everyone everything you see has probably been done about fucking three or four times minimum i did a i did a tommy shelby uh alfie solomon scene which is like only like a minute minute long dialect just try to remember the script because i'm just trying to like build that skill set it took me 75 takes just stood in my room <laughs> man for two hours just like get right to the end of the script like fuck like forget the word <laughs> It's a nightmare. Shall I give it a go? Oh, it's going to sound pony now that we've put the pressure on it, isn't it? <laughs> if it's the same shit, Paul cut it, mate. <laughs> <laughs> That's why he's my new manager. <laughs> um, yeah, I can go. I'll just do one of the screams from like the, the Insta reels where it's like, um, you wrote me a letter, Alfie. That was a bit of shit. You wrote me a letter, Alfie. Now we go, a bit better. Yeah, the second one always a bit rough. I was, I was I was I was looking away to see if I could hear it. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, yeah, so, uh, like because any character, like because I get loads of people who are like I've done like The Witcher, like anyone that's got a bit the of Witcher. A, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> big fan of The Witcher. <laughs> <laughs> The game and the series. <laughs> you, I mean, do you know The Witcher? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So people are like anything. I get compared to like. Uh, like not not them because they're fucking legends but like the usually the characters are like Killian Murphy Henry Cavill Tom Hardy like anyone that's got a bit of a gravelly yeah, yeah, deeper voice, a gravelly voice so it's like anyone that I can and they're kind of the easier accents that I can do but I'm just trying to build that arsenal and skill set because I think it's an important skill it'd be mm. fun like, I'd love to expand into like um, I'm starting to get into more like commercial stuff if I can I'd love to voice a video game oh. That's the one. That'd be it? fucking sick. That's the one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Down a Bethesda game, mate. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's just yeah, it's been a fucking crazy few years to be fair. But yeah. and your TikTok's doing quite well now, isn't it? Yeah, I just hit 100k. Yeah. Um, how many views have you had? <laughs> fuck. Like my three pinned videos, I've got 
so I've had I've had at least five go over a million, but the three top players, one that's nearly on, so one's on like over five. These aren't even like the impressions; they're just me doing like comedy, silly, jokey stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, one's an impression; it's like on a mil and a half. One's on like five mil, and another's on like four and a half mil. And I can't. When, when it's so funny because the one that went viral is kind of what we were talking about earlier about the men's stigma. So it's a stitch, which is like just like a, a cut scene, basically, where a woman is in a car and she says, uh, "Men will literally bury their face in your ass, but won't tell you about how they're feeling, or something like that." And then it cuts to me, and I'm just like, "There is no lie." That's all I say. And, it, <laughs> and that went like viral. over like 5 million views. I was like, that's so fucking <laughs> That's fucking And then gross. another one was, um, there's like a filter where it's like your biggest insecurity. And I'm like, fucking give it a bit. I'm like, I'll fucking bring it on, mate. You bring it on. I can take it. And then it cuts to crooked teeth. And I smile and I've got crooked teeth. And I'm like, <laughs> fuck you. And, <laughs> and again, that was, so it's just like the simplicity of like stuff like that. It's weird how it works. Yeah. We, we, we've been, we, we've almost given up second guessing it now, mate. Because... <laughs> We just fucking we never know. Yeah. We, just we, never we can't see you like, this is a fucking good one. Yeah. This, is a, <laughs> this is a fucking good one. It goes out, there's nothing. Then some some that are shit, we're like, nah, fucking, should we, should we still put it out? It's fucking 100,000, yeah. 200,000, a million, whatever. You know yeah, what I mean? Mate, it's, fuck me. Yeah, so weird, mate. There's genuinely been a couple where we've just like bounced them back a few a mm. few weeks because like we've put another one in front of it and eventually we've got, oh, we need to just get it out, get it out. And yeah, it's done all right. So yeah, you can never guess it, mate. It's a <laughs> fucking weird space, mate, to live in. But but I want to talk, mate, about the mental health stuff that you were obviously involved in. You've been an advocate, I think, for many years and you've you've been involved on a, a number of different podcasts and I know you've had your own challenges as well, mate. Um but tell us, I, I guess, you know, a little bit about that. Why, why are you a mental, mental health advocate? What does that mean? Yeah, so mental health like, advocacy for me is just kind of more so over the last, like, since like 2017. So when I was at uni, so uh, the, the reason kind of I got started being more public with my mental health journey and just like talking about difficult stuff was I just didn't think there was too many people like, that I looked up to that would, were doing it and that like, I probably needed it at the time. And then, yeah, so the reason I kind of started doing it more was because it, in 2015, 2016, my mum had a couple of uh, breakdowns with her illness. She's schizoaffective whilst I was at uni and just before uni. And that was like the first time I really learned of her illness, um, like consciously, even though it affected my life like, all through my childhood. Um, so I kind of wanted to, as I learned that, it was like a, for me, I was like, well, I want to help educate people on different stigmas and kind of the journey I went through and stuff. Obviously I couldn't share my mum's perspective, but like, yeah, from, from my point of view, I like just support people um, and just kind of be as transparent as possible really. So it kind of just took off from there. So yeah, I've been on social media in particular, publicly talking about it since like 2017. Mm. Yeah. yeah, it feels like the landscape's changed a lot, I think in that time as mm. well, regarding the openness about it and, and certainly people, you know, talking about maybe their struggles mentally and low mood and everything. Um, and a, a little bit more around sort of things like ADHD and, and the sort of, you know, sort of neurological differences mm. that people have. Mm -hmm. And can you tell us a little bit about your own experiences with, I guess, these sort of mental health conditions and also you know, sort of neural spiciness? Yeah, so for me, like my, I thought my mental health journey started when I was like consciously, as I say, uh, was like from the age of like 13. So my dad passed away when I was a teenager and I like started experiencing like depression and like having all these emotions, obviously like grief, like kind of those natural things you would experience with like that kind of scenario. Um, and I was just like constantly feeling like low, but from a young age, um, I don't know what kind of drew me to do it, but I remember like talking to like the school, mental, like school nurse for the first time, but it was quite, I can kind of laugh at it now looking back, but at the time, I think she was expecting a 13 year old kid to come in with a knock from football. Uh -huh. And I was just like there, sat there. I was just like face like blank, just being like, and I, I, I said this before and other stuff, but like, I still to this day don't know what I said to her. It was like a movie where like the, it, it all kind of zooms in, everything slows down, there's like a music playing. And I was just like chatting her ear off, just her, like venting. <laughs> and, uh, and I just remember like, she was just like, oh, you need some help, don't you, darling? I think she got like, I can't remember. I'm pretty sure she like cried. I was like, oh shit, I need to. <laughs> it was like, okay, I need to like kind of get stuff done. But yeah, that, that was for me like the first like proper chapter. And then it's kind of been like, I'm still kind of discovering and learning as I get older. So it's like, 
it actually all started for me like when I was literally first two years of my life. Like I was literally born into like my mum was had a mental illness. We was I was raised like the first two years of my life in like a German military barracks. My dad was in the army. He was serving in Bosnia. So it was like all like quite chaotic intro to life. And then yeah, like over the last like twenty over over twenty years, it's been like learning about myself uh grief patterns the the impact of like other people's mental health and mental illnesses um and then for me um my biggest like open experience where i was like uh started to kind of take notes of like okay, i think i've got deeper issues here maybe i've got my own like mental health issues and illnesses was 2018 when i left uni i left uni on like a proper high like it was like the best time of my life i had freedom I was a, as an athlete, I just felt like the boy. <laughs> and then I went and like, um, I moved away. I um, wasn't an athlete anymore. I had to like, I took like a corporate job in London. I was commuting like two hours door to door every day. And life was, I had like no friends and life was fucking shit. I went from being like up here to like down here. And it was like post uni depression. But I was like in a bad way. I was like suicidal in like, as close as like, I've, I've kind of probably got in those in those headspaces. And I was just like, went through that experience. And it's just been constant up and down for, for 20 odd years. So I started making sure that I was being a bit more self-aware and taking note of those experiences and those kind of chapters. So over the last four years or so in particular, I was, I was doing that and then taking mood logs because I was constantly up and down always going back to kind of really depressive low spots, but also getting quite excitable and high. Mm. Um, and it wasn't, it was through that kind of exploration and self-awareness that like um, I went down the road of like chats with GPs and having like exploratory chats and then it actually getting diagnosed with bipolar type two. So it was kind of like a really scattered wide jigsaw puzzle that over the, like, the years I've just been like slowly piecing together. And I still, I'm probably always going to be, I'm still always learning stuff about my family history, my own mental health, my own reactions, like to this day, I probably always will. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just like a big jigsaw puzzle and some people have got some more stuff figured out. Some people got less and some people, yeah. So it's just fascinating to me now. Yeah, I bet. I, I have a, a loose idea of what bipolar condition is. Um, I didn't know there were different types until you just said type two. Um, are you able to explain that for us? Sure. So um, bipolar is a mood disorder, which is kind of categorized typically in major highs and major lows. Um, and, you know, I'm still learning loads about the condition because I only got diagnosed maybe a year and a half ago. And I think it's quite similar with um, a lot of mental illnesses. It's like there's a, everyone's got like a certain not a spectrum, I guess kind of almost like a spectrum, but everyone's different. Mm. I've got friends that are bipolar, but they react differently to, to me and vice versa. So bipolar type two is like kind of considered the less severe. So a bi bipolar type one would be on your high, you can fall into like beliefs and like so much like, e like ecstatic happiness that you kind of feel like you're invincible and maybe you think you're like, actually like God and unbeatable kind of thing, um, which obviously can be quite harmful and, and dangerous. And then the low is literally like risk, like suicidal, re really, um, really bad. How quickly do you flitter from happy to sad? So if that makes sense. Yeah, like, of course. Yeah. How, how quickly does that change? So it, for, for typically it kind of comes in like, for me um, with, with type two, because it's considered less severe, but like for me, it comes in like chapters. So I'll go through periods where I'm norm normal, quote unquote. Um, but then my kind of depressive episodes can last like two, three weeks. For some people it's months. Um, you can have this thing called like rapid cycling where you can flick uh, between the two, like in a couple of days. Um, but for me, and then like my highs when I'm a bit like hypermanic and like, uh, like excitable and just like super like ready to go, it can be, like a week again, two weeks, sometimes for people months. But yeah, for me, I'm, you know, quite fortunately it's, it's not too severe and that cause I'm more aware of it now. Like I'm st and like I can notice the triggers, what kind of set sets me off in either way. Is that, um, is that controlled through, is it now controlled through, through medication? So I'm still not medicated, but it's a- Do they offer it? Though? Yeah, yeah. So I've, I've had multiple conversations about it now for a, f a few months. Um, but I've always, 
it's probably the stigma, which I'm trying to actually ironically try and stop, but it's like, I am trying to do everything I can in my lifestyle to stop, not do that. Um, which is, that's just my choice. I don't, it's not because I don't think medication doesn't work. I think medication's helped so many people I know and it's such an, a valuable asset. But for me right now, like in, in my life, I want to try and control as much as I can before I go onto that step. And do, do you think like looking after your body and that then helps your mind? Yeah. Like, so if you were physically fit, doing the right things, getting enough sleep, getting enough hydration in, all that stuff, the, mm-hmm. fu- the fundamentals essentially, yeah. does that help you? 100%, 100%. And I think, you know, you see it so much now on like content and social media that like people push it and people are like, ah, oh. but like you, it really does. <laughs> it's not like a gimmick like that people think it is. Like it's like, I think the one that I've, I, I uh, overestimated for years was sleep. And that's actually yeah. ironically the biggest trigger in like bipolar is if your sleep pattern and your sleep rhythm gets fucked and you're fucked. I can swear, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> if, if, if you don't get enough sleep, mate, yeah. you fucking hell, you start the day off shit. Don't yeah. You? And then that goes what, even yeah. worse and even worse. And then you get bad, like if you get cranky, your relationships, yeah. your eating habits. Um, People like, around you are like, fucking what's wrong with this prick? Yeah. Carry on. You know? <laughs> Straight on it. So I actually, um, yeah, sleep, sleep. Like uh, nutrition is another one that I've kind of definitely underestimated. Um, so I'm trying to sort that out. And then I've gone sober. So alcohol was the biggest one for me. So just starting to get back into my kind of fitness and my nutrition, but like just starting to take the wheel a bit more. But yeah, that kind of whole package of the com- combination of all four or five kind of key factors in, in health and fitness, 100%. Yeah. And how does it affect your relationships typically? It's not great. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, was a, that was the next thing I was about to ask. Like how the fuck are you, how do, how do you cope with that? Like as in for the people around you yeah, as well. It's, it's, tricky yeah so to, to add a little bit of context years ago I, I dated a girl for a bit who said she was bipolar mm. um and again I, I didn't know too much about it but i must say answering the door to it was like russian roulette it was like, mm. like is it gonna go off yeah, yeah. And someday she'd be amazing I, i'd say she had probably a type one from what mm. you said okay. she was like extremely high mm-hmm. and then other occasions like an absolute nightmare and that was a real challenge and inevitably it didn't last very long yeah no, it's definitely tough. And that's why I'm definitely um, like empathetic to, to people. And, and probably why I'm like, especially in my like friendship groups, like I'm quite, I can, I'm quite reserved. So I'm trying to like, in my like healing era, um, I'm actually reading a book, a journal at the minute, I'm doing a journal at the minute called like, it's like about attachment styles and how you react in relationships and like what triggers you to like, and I'm a disorganized. So it means that I'm very like avoidant and anxious. So like I really need attention and like support and love, but also fucking leave me alone so it's like that flit can really mess with people so like i've had i've had relationships um but uh definitely like on a reflection like i put them through a fucking tough time like um and i like, like admiration for them and respect for them for like how they kind of coped with me at the time especially at the time when i wasn't aware of my illness and stuff like that but my friends they kind of get that i'm a bit of a complicated character like i am gonna fucking disappear for a bit and they kind of let me resurface when as and when some people that don't understand me or if they're kind of like new into my life they can get a bit like offended because they're like well why aren't you making an effort with me or why aren't you like pushing for this and it's like i don't like it's hard to kind of justify it but it's yeah it, it does flick and then like yeah like at the minute of my circle's small but as i say i've you know you have to I understand why it would be kind of uh, difficult for people to understand if they have to walk away or if they have to distance themselves. And I'm, I don't get offended by that either, mm. which is, I think, a big thing because I'm a sensitive lad. <laughs> so, like, yeah, at the time, like, um, if people were to, like, walk away or, like, abandon me, it's like, what have I done wrong? But, like, now as you get older, you kind of, like, everyone's got their own life. Everyone's got to put themselves first. And if I don't suit, if that is triggering for them the way I react and they have to kind of isolate or distance and I respect that. I imagine it helped being diagnosed. So oh, now yeah. you understand it. Yeah. That's the biggest thing. How many people are walking around undiagnosed? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I had to, I, I that's why I did, made sure I had to do like the mood journals because I was like, something's fucking up and I know it. And it was like a weight on your shoulder of like an invisible enemy. And I've got notes in my phone for when I was going through depressive episodes. I was like, why am I always back here? No matter what I do, I eat healthy, I train, I do this, I go for runs, I try and do this, make these changes, but I always end up back here. Why? 
And then it was when I got diagnosed, I was like, that makes fucking sense now. <laughs> <laughs> um, it obviously doesn't like eliminate the issue, but it's still like, once you know what you're fighting against, it does make a, a bit smooth, easier, slightly. <laughs> yeah, I, I, going back to the attachment styles thing, we, we've got um, an interview with Dr. Ju uh, Judy Ho coming up soon. Oh, we're familiar. Um, she's a bit of a uh, authority in that field, but I came across her recently as well. And it's fascinating, isn't it? Yeah. yeah it, gives yeah. You really, it really gives you just, yeah, really good understanding about, I guess, your own personality. But as yeah. you say, I think understanding like how, what other people's attachment styles are and how they conflict or can mm. conflict with your own. And I think then that allows you to be a bit more objective, as you say, around when people maybe get on your case about not spending time with them. That's probably because of their attachment style. Yeah, yeah, literally. And when people maybe just, you know, kind of walk away from a, a relationship as well. Mm -hmm. So I think that sort of stuff and understanding both that and the diagnosis must help a lot. Yes, and I, I, it's because I'm, like this year in particular, end of last year, like with the sobriety, like proper focusing on this healing and like I know my relationship's been like, so I do want to like, I'm really bad at like not appreciating the people around me. Like I'm not really good. I'm not really like a compliment giver or like outgoing in that sense. But like, I think it and I feel it. I just don't show it. So I was like, I need to, I want to work on that. But yeah, like it was, I had a cool moment. It's not a cool moment, but like a healing, like hazard moment where um, I would say I had like tricky relationships where up and down, people wasn't sure and stuff like this. But um learnt of my attachment style, learnt of others. And then I was dating a girl where it was triggering me, like it was with an ex. And I was like, ding, trigger, don't like this. I need to communicate that this isn't gonna work. Um, it's affected me and did it like that. And I was just after that, even though it was like a, like, yeah, stop dating someone. I was just like fist pumping. And I was like, fucking <laughs> figure something out. <laughs> but um, yeah, like that stuff like that was like those little wins really like help with the self awareness and like it proves that putting in the work like that, which you wouldn't consider. Like if you speak to most of the lads in the pub and you're like, "What? What's your attachment style like?" I'm like All right, bro, fucking hell. <laughs> <laughs> That's me, mate. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> I got a lot. So I mean, like, like yeah, yeah, stuff like that, or like love language. Like, All right, mate, chill out. <laughs> like, so it's like stuff like that. Like um, once you realise if you can just like portray it in a way that is understandable to them, like why why are you arguing with your missus all the time? Like mm. stuff like that. It's like, okay. Like, like, yeah, you've gone down the pub for six hours, but if you haven't communicated in the right way, like she would probably be fine, but mm. it's just understanding that you're not like running away from her. <laughs> it's, yeah. So it's hard. It's hard. It's really hard. But yeah. And I think exactly that communication with those around, you, I think is really important as well and giving them understanding. So it's not just self-awareness, mm -hmm. but it's also creating, you know, awareness to those around you so they can understand those behaviors. So it sounds like you're making some good strides there, mate. Did I see that you've got ADHD as well? So that one is like a bit of a, it's the it's the number one red flag of what I don't want people to do. It's like a jokey self-diagnosis because my friends always say to me. Okay. So rule number one, please don't self-diagnose. <laughs> so people listening. But it was more of like, um, I need to get the, the official diagnosis, but all of my friends who kind of like around me they're like, mate, you're so, but what's interesting is there's a lot of crossover between bipolar and ADHD. So there's a lot of similar symptoms. So it can kind of get a bit like built up and masked up. But um, yeah, like that stuff, especially since going sober, like I've noticed when I'm not masked with like alcohol and stuff, like yeah, my attention is like, and like little triggers and things like that. But my friend, uh, I went for a beer with him in the summer and, um, he was like, are you all right? And I was like, yeah. And I was just literally like looking around the room, like observing. You can see my mind was going a hundred miles an hour. I couldn't focus. And he was like, mate, you're so ADHD. It's like a bad <laughs> thing for her to say, but um, that's a goal for me this year as well is to explore that with like an actual official diagnosis. Mm. And and then if I do do that, I've got some amazing like content creator friends in the ADHD space that I'm kind of learning from. They're educating me. And so it's like, I think that's the first part is like understanding the symptoms and what other people are going through and then pushing for the diagnosis if they're relatable. Yeah, it's an interesting one because we, we often joke about us having an issue yeah. as well because we're, we're both nightmares like that. <laughs> and honestly, I'm, and I don't know if it's my notes sometimes in the, even in these conversations, I'm thinking about the next question mm. before I've even heard the answer to the first one. <laughs> <laughs> but that might just me be, being, being anal. But I know I, online you've got these ADHD tests that you can do, haven't you? Mm-hmm. And I've looked at them before, but what I found myself doing was almost a confirmation bias. Yes. Where I'd, I'd look at the questions go, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah I'm yeah. looking for this outcome. So yeah, that's me. <laughs> yeah. 
So I, I, yeah, I don't know how they actually diagnose that without without you almost kind of yeah. leading you in some way. It's so true, so true. And I think there's, as well as so many resources and like stuff like that online that has become more available, it is easier to self-diagnose. Like yeah. how many times have you been like, I don't know if you've been like hungover, you've got a stomach ache, you Google the symptoms, you're like, oh, I've got stomach cancer now. Yeah, that's it. So, right. <laughs> so, <laughs> probably had like 10 cancers over the years. I think I've had brain tumours, all sorts, right? <laughs> yeah, it's a fucking yeah. nightmare. It's, it's easy to fall down that hole though. I think a lot of people do it, but yeah, it's just... I think a lot of people play on it as well. Do you know what I mean? With like yeah. self-diagnosis, they go, oh yeah, I've got ADHD and then they speak and then they kind of convince themselves they've got ADHD mm. instead of actually fucking helping themselves in their fucking life. You know what I mean? They just... They just don't know what they want. They don't know where they're going. They don't know this and that. And then they're like, oh, there must be something wrong with me. Mm. So not all the time it is. You know what I mean? So it's that other side of it. Yeah, know? there's definitely, it's a, it's a, it's a hard, it's a hard one. It's because there is that, that, that balance. And it's like, there's a really good quote I always see online. And I always try and reshare it where it's like, um, um, taking accountability for your own suffering, like self, like growth is mm. like taking accountability of your own suffering. And for me, although like, um, it's, it, it's probably not relatable to like ADHD or bipolar, but for me with my suffering, it was like the drinking and I can't then sit around, I knew my voice would break. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, you can't sit around and uh, like, I was like sitting around whinging and complaining about the lack of progression I was making in my life. I've got notes on my phone where I was like, I'm hungover for three days in a row. I've lost all this momentum. I'm like, well, stop fucking drinking and <laughs> you twat. I was like, yeah. you, you know what's like causing you the issues. I think that's one, that's what I'm, I'm fucking so unsympathetic with shit like that because where, when someone is doing something like that and then they moan about their yeah. life, I'm like, just stop, stop fucking drinking. We'll do those things that like, if you're really fat and you're fucking unhappy, you're fat, you know, do something about it. If you're unhappy about anything, your work, your job, anything, change it. Mm. You know what I mean? People think that they get in a hole where they can't change stuff and they can't see a way out. But realistically, it's not going to kill you to change jobs. It's not going to kill you. You know, nothing's going to fall apart massively. And that's what people are like always scared to take that next yeah. step. But, but I think but I think that's the key word though, mate. I think it's easy for people to be scared. And I think yeah. sometimes people can't see the woods through the trees. So yeah. I think you need to be a little bit empathetic with people taking some time, I think, to get to that point. Sometimes I'm not that empathetic. This is shit. Are we talking about attachment styles? <laughs> Avoidant is fuck, mate. Just, just don't care. <laughs> no, it's not. I don't care. I just feel like some people are like just bordo and and um, you know they could help themselves faster if that makes sense. Because I think it only become it comes from where I worked for years in a shop and I seen a lot of young men, especially coming in playing games, sitting on their ass, saying they've got this, that, the other fucking bullshit they used to say to me it was bullshit whatever just couldn't be asked to do anything they would get paid from the government they would go home they sit in a flat on their own and then they would come in going i'm depressed and I, the amount of conversations i had with these people being like you know get to the gym you know get yourself a girlfriend try and do this try and do that yeah yeah i can't because you know i just can't get out of bed in the morning or, or i'd give them an opportunity i'd be like oh we'll come in and i might be able to give you a job and stuff like this i'll come in for nine i can't come in for nine well why not well because i just don't get out of bed as well them. You know what I mean? Like right. things like that where I'm like, oh, for I think there's sake. definitely a continuum, isn't there, of, of, of levels with people. I think, 100%, I think yeah. some people are so fucked in, in every endeavor of their life. They don't even know where to start. Yes, there's definitely like a connection with um, like support around you, role models, motivations. Like, 100%. Um, yeah, like I, I kind of, I don't know where I saw it, but it was like, uh, I think it was like a Post Malone clip, but it was like someone was like, and who got you out of that hole? And he was like, me only me like it can only be and it's true it can only be you that can get you out of like tough situations you kind of have to have that confidence in yourself but it's the it's the support and the resources you have around you that can ultimately educate you or help you kind of navigate it easy like smoother but it's a lot of groundwork yourself for sure you gotta help yourself haven't you yeah. like number one I, I had something similar where everyone around you you know your partner your, even your kids everyone you like, they can fall out of love with you. You can do something and they, they won't talk to you or whatever. But if you don't look after yourself, first and foremost, all the people around you won't love you as much. Because if you are a bit of a deadbeat and you are drinking, laying in bed, not doing this, not doing, people won't appreciate you. And then that appreciation comes, the love comes and the, mm -hmm. everything else comes around that. So if you don't look after yourself and you're just fucking doing this, yeah, you the, never get anywhere. And then that hole becomes deeper and deeper. The self-love, self self-reflection thing, self-awareness thing for me is like the biggest bit. Because it's like, 
self awareness is huge. Because if you are like the drinking and you're in bed and it's like you got to have that, those hard fucking conversations with yourself. It's like, well, why am I doing this? What's making me do this? Like, what do I want to do? What's it's a lot of why, what, like there's a lot of that in your it's head. It's like weed smoking, like when people smoke weed all the time. It's not, I, I've never got a problem with people smoking weed. I don't give a fuck what people do. But what I do have a problem with is when I've got a client or someone and they're, they're smoking weed every night and then they can't get to work on time. Mm. <laughs> or they're, they're then they're missing meal prep, they're missing this and that because they're high as fuck all the time and then they get paranoid and then that leads to other shit. Yeah. And I'm like, it all stemmed from this. Yeah. They're like, yeah, but you know, weed's not, I'm not saying it is, but it's all stemmed from the distraction that you're giving yourself. You're not in a clear headspace. Yeah. And that's where it starts, you know? It's like a, it's like a layer of like a, a cake in a way. It's like, um, cause all those stuff, like the, like if it's weed or drugs or whatever you, yeah. your substance stuff is, that's like, the, that's like the actual symptom. And then there's that behavior from the symptom, which is like they're not turning up to work, they're laying in bed. And then underneath that is usually like the core of like the trauma or something like that. So it's like, it's kind of, like I say, I kind of knew there was something bubbling away there for, for years and years, but it was like, it was kind of down to me to kind of start unearthing all that. And that's the hard bit. I think that people either aren't aware that that's kind of how it can work or it's just like, you, you kind of don't have the right resources around you. So hopefully like, more people like this and conversations and podcasts like yourselves are like having those conversations. It's like, oh, there are, they're in the same boat as what I was in or I've done this. So it's like, it's such a hard landscape, but yeah, you're like, so you have, there's like that, it's a horrible balance of like that tough love and then empathy. Oh yeah. It's so oh, hard to get right. I don't think you ever it, will. I, I don't think you ever will no. because you've got people on both sides of the spectrum, yeah. haven't you? Like some people are like, this is just my opinion. Some people are way over the top of it. And then some people are just, no sympathy. And I think, oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've got some, I've got some. But I think, I think there's finding like a happy, you know, a middle ground with it all. And I think sometimes if you overthink things, then you're in your head all the time and you never actually get anywhere because you're thinking about, oh, how I'm feeling. And then if you overthink that, I think you can, that can be dangerous. And then there's dickheads like me who are just like, oh, get out of it. You know what I mean? And then one day I'll just fucking jump off a bridge or something, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, no, don't do that, mate. Don't do that. I'm <laughs> what are your thoughts on, um, I guess, social media and the impact that has on mental health these days? Because you just mentioned some positives there where you can get some really good resource. Mm -hmm. But also I think, it's just ruin, viewing for that lens, isn't it? Because I, I, I'm, I don't know how old you are, mate, but I'm sort of forties ish now. Forties ish, what? what Forty one. <laughs> yeah, um, so I grew up in a time when social media didn't exist. Mm -hmm. um, I think I got Facebook literally when I was twenty five. So I've lived half my life pretty much without social media mm -hmm. and half with. And the half without was when I grew up in 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 sort of poverty. You know, it wasn't extreme poverty, but it was a very deprived area. Um, you know, my parents didn't have a lot of money, but everybody was poor. And I was oblivious to how the other half lived. So the fact that I didn't have anything didn't matter because no one else had anything. The fact mm. we were out stone fighting as a way yeah. of saying it <laughs> didn't matter. But if I was looking on Instagram mm -hmm. and I was seeing how the other half lived, and that would really impact me, I think. And also there's, there's a good resource, but there's also a bad resource as well. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, there's definitely, um, it's so easy to fall in the trap of like comparing lives and lifestyles and being like, especially if you're like, um, a competitive person or if you've got like a bit of like a slight ego where you're like you can fall into the trap of like how oh, have they got that when I've, I do this I work harder and like they've got this and it's it can be very like com comparative um, and yeah like it's weird because like I yeah I've always been a bit of a social media fin fiend since like a young age like I was on Bebo and like Facebook and I was just Fucking using Bebo you know, I remember yeah, that throwback <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember Bebo? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was never, I was never on it. I was mate. in school and that was like, yeah. it. was fucking big for a, it was like big for about a year. <laughs> um, but I used to like use Facebook as like a journal, and people was like, "Shut up!" So yeah. I just I'd use, I'd just sit there all night and just be like, "I had fucking chicken tikka masala for dinner." <laughs> send like just putting all this shit in the world that I had no like repercussions. <laughs> of, like, <laughs> so yeah, stupid, yeah. yeah. it was like such like a, a stupid thing. But like, um, but when you come to like the the dangers of content and I think now with its popularity and you know it, it is a career and um so many different personalities and people's angles and political agendas and stuff and roots they can steer down and especially with like algorithms these days mm. like like one thing that I've noticed a lot for me is I consume a lot of like positive content so like if you go through my um, Instagram 
feed now. There's a lot of positive quotes. There's a lot of kind of people that I find like inspiring and motivating. But all it takes you to, if you're in a bit of a, a lull or uh, to fall into like four or five of those videos that are a bit more negative, yeah. a bit of sprinkle of negativity or a different agenda on there and you can fall into a trap. Mm -hmm. And it's, I think an awareness of that needs to, to grow. Um, it's hard, it's definitely hard. Um, but for me, yeah, it's it's always been relatively positive. There was a there was a book I read from Uriah Faber, um, where it was a chapter that really stood out to me where he was like, Envy is like poison. So there was a time when I was in my young teens where I was DMing every single like celebrity that I was like, Oh, I love you so much and just I wanna be like them, I wanna do this, I wanna like just like bum licking everyone really. I still do it sometimes. But <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but like I kind of put my self-respect like so much lower than others, mm. than I was putting too much other people's, that like, I was following on social media respect so much higher than my own value. And over the last like, it's only over the last year and a half year that I've started to like drop that. And it's like, they're just humans. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you'll see people online and you're like, oh my fucking God, like I, they need to, I need to take all their words as gospel. And it's like, no, not really. Like it, you take everything as like a pit, like, a pinch of salt like you can't take everyone's word as like the word like you have to build and devise your own narratives from the people that you enjoy following and stuff like that it's a minefield I'm yeah. sure you guys have all appreciated like been through that yeah. as well <laughs> yeah it's tough mate because before funny enough before we did this and I think you're still kind of like it now we both talk about that we need to be better but we were both like like you know, sort of social media recluses before yeah. this yeah I yeah. fucking hate them mate. yeah, yeah. And, and <laughs> even, hate even though I had like accounts the only stuff I'll post on there was in relation to work. Um, and and part of that was because I didn't want to be on it. So I wasn't really consuming either. Although I was watching a lot of YouTube and never really considered that social media. Yeah. It definitely is. <laughs> That's like TV. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It is like TV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. So I, um, yeah, I wasn't really consuming or creating. But now I've found that because we're creating a lot, mm -hmm. I find myself consuming more mm -hmm. as well. Um, and it, it's a really tough one to manage that. To, 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 to definitely and I think again because we're creating there's a dopamine yeah. like attachment to yeah. it as well so I'm always on my phone oh, does someone like our video what's the views on and that creates like a little bit of addiction yeah. that occasionally I just need to have a reset on and, and kind of turn off so yeah it's a tough one man. I definitely have that like it was, it was I feel like um, for all of my teenage years I feel like that's where I was like seeking my like reassurance yeah. and like people to pat me on the back from it was like it? yeah like definitely and I was just like Please think I'm fucking cool. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone's like, you're a gimp. I'm like, oh, yeah, I am. <laughs> and then it's like, once you start like scraping all the kind of um, the fake bollocks and like stop trying to people please as much and just like focus on what you enjoy and absorbing the content and posting what you want to post. It's like, there's obviously still balance of like, if you, especially if it's in your world of work, like you, you have to kind of build that aesthetic, but it's, uh, yes. Yeah, the next mindset. generation are fucked, aren't they? I think so, <laughs> my, my lad is like 11, 12, yeah. you know, fuck, you know, I feel sorry for him sometimes. Yeah, you know? well, I think it's like, uh, it's it's when people replace like this, like real- Conversation, yeah. yeah. Like with that, uh, Cameron Shamey had on the podcast a little while back and he talked about it and he said, it was really interesting. So he said that people uh, don't have nutritious relationships. Mm. So they have, you know, social media and the internet's amazing because it, it allows you to connect with people all around the world now, which you never had the ability to do before. But it's when people entirely replace that style of communication and, and relationship with real communication. And he said that, you know, yeah, it's communication, but McDonald's is also food. Mm. You know what I mean? It's shit, unnutritious food. <laughs> Sorry, McDonald's, but it's true. <laughs> um, so it's almost like they're eating McDonald's, mm. you know, in relation to their relationships. Yeah. And I think that's a massive issue. I think people don't put enough stock into being in people's company, shaking hands with people, making eye contact with people. Yeah. Even just putting your phone away. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean, you go over someone's, we, I've done it before. You go over someone's house, we'll go out for a fucking meal. Everyone's like, oh yeah, let's go out for a meal. Go out for a meal. Every, every comes on their phone. Yeah. I'm like, fuck, you know, put your phone away. It's pointless me coming. I might as well not go. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely, you see it as well with like, um, like relationships and like it's a big topic at the minute and like dating because all the dating apps are like gamified and yeah. it's like a certain kind of agenda. And then you're so f used to just having like a digital conversation. And when you come, like say people are like, when you come face to face, they're like, 
<laughs> I'm so glad I'm not in that way. I'm like, right. I'm, I'd be fucking shit at it. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be like, mate, you do not, <laughs> mate. <laughs> so I'll, be like, I'll be like, you do not like your photos. <laughs> yeah, straight up. I know, mate. You get a lot of fucking catfish, you know, you. But, but, mate, I I used to hire PTs with my with my old job, and we've talked about it before. Where I get these, like, I don't know, like graduates coming in, and they're like an amazing knowledge base. But they couldn't even make eye contact Can't with communicate, you. Or. Yeah, or they couldn't string a sentence together. And I just feel that's just, yeah, it's, it can't be good heading mm. in that direction. Bad habits, isn't it? Like, say, like, I'm really bad for, like, being, like, pick, like, checking my phone. Like, nothing, no, no notification, nothing. I'm just, like, searching for something. Yeah, I'm just, like, yeah. constantly looking. I'm like, I don't need to fucking look. Yeah. Like, I think I need to separate that shit. I've said it a few times. I think I need, like, something separate for business. Because, like, with my clients yeah. and with this and with everything else, we do get a lot of messages now, don't we? And Kirsty, my missus, is like, oh, um, you on your phone again? And I'm like, yeah. yeah, I am. And she's right. Yeah. She's fucking right. I know she's right, you know, but I'm like checking it because I've got messages and we're sorting something out or, you know, I'm sorting out podcast stuff. Or I'm sorting this out. Or I've got client messages or, I've, you know, just the, the array of things that seem to be going on on my phone fucking all the time. And she's right. She's like, put it away. You know, it'll still be there tomorrow. And I'm like, yeah, but, you know, I need to do this and that. And I, I always justify it, but she's actually right. Yeah. Yeah. It's a tough one. And I, I think I, w- I want to kind of come on to like talking in a second because I know you run Gents Who Vent, mm-hmm. um, which is a really cool sort of platform for guys to talk. Um, and obviously, male depression is a massive thing in the UK and the West at the moment. And male suicide is the biggest killer of men, I think, out of 50 now. Mm. So all of us sat here right now, the biggest risk to our life is ourselves, which is insane when you put it like it's that. Something crazy, isn't it? Really? Yeah. That's sucky. And there's obviously, you know, a number of different camps. Like Danny talked earlier about, you know, sort of people just need to help themselves. And you've talked about your own sort of self-development. Um, and another thing is, is you know, do guys talk enough? And part of it, you know, you wonder, are they talking, but is it only digitally? And maybe that's not enough. Maybe they need to be in groups, like at somewhere like Andy's Man Club. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, tell us about Gents Event, how that came about and, and what that is and, and what your thoughts are on, on talking. Yeah, so... Yeah, it's mass, like it's, uh, it's so important. So for me, Gents Event was like a network I put together. It's essentially a WhatsApp group. We have like an Instagram page, but I don't really monitor it or use it as much. But because um, I don't like, yeah, I don't promote it as much as I probably should. But it's a it's a WhatsApp group. There's about 55, 60 to 60 lads in there now. That I, so when I was going through depressive episodes, because I say I was always ending up back down there, it was like that balance of I was advocating talking and mental health for years, but then thankfully people were coming to me for support and reaching out to talk but if i'm in a lull and a low i don't want to fucking talk to people so it was hard it was a horrible balance of being like i want to help i physically can't i don't have the capacity um i can't even figure out my own shit right now um so i kind of when i came out of that low i had about four or five mates that i was like look so just bang us all in a group chat some of them weren't like mates some of them just like uh like at the time just alliances like online that we kind of knew each other through like content and then, um, yeah, it started with like five of us. So like the reason I set it up is because it's like a, it's almost like an always on platform where especially now we've got bigger, even if someone doesn't have the mental capacity to tell uh, if they're struggling with, so we have all sorts of stuff from like people struggling with like divorce, work stuff, relationships, illness, um, like literally so many different like topics that we will mention. Um, there'll always be someone in there to reply. And thankfully people do, and it kind of runs its, itself. And people, or the boys, it's so nice because I've become like closer with my own pals. Um, so I think out of like my core friendship group, I feel like nearly 80% of my core friendship group are in that. <laughs> um, so they, they, and then there's people that were strangers. There's people that I used to work with as colleagues. There were people that used to be my old clients, people I've never met before around the world. And we're all just, everyone's from different ethnicities, religious backgrounds, like, and it's just, everyone's in there for the same goal of just like trying to be happy and make it through life as a man, trying to navigate the landscape. So it's like, you've got different personalities, you've got, you know, you've got like the fitness guys, you've got the people that are a bit more like the artsy, creative guys. So it's just a real balance and blend and everyone just understands that you're all, I nearly said the same boat, it's not the same boat. You're all in the same storm but it's, you're in kind of different vessels and trying to navigate. So it's like, um, it was a, it was a, it was a kind of, um, yeah, I'm, I'm super proud of it, but I always, there's always a guilt of like feeling like you, I need to be doing more of it and promoting it more. But essentially it's just, I know it's helping 
people. So and that's I'm I'm happy with that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so and, yeah. And is it just it's just uh, is it just text messaging like via WhatsApp or so do you yes. guys have like like sort of virtual meets or face to face meets or anything? So initially we started it's, it's, a, it's a WhatsApp group just texting, but we did do a couple of virtual meets, and as it's kind of got bigger, it's been a bit harder to navigate because. You know, I've been trying to set up like face to face meets as well, and when you got like fifty lads, some are in international, they're all that would occur in the UK. You're never getting the same dates, uh, so it's like it's really hard. But I, I'm planning, we're planning to do like a um, like a hike this year, so in the spring, go do Snowden or something together, um, bit of like a collective. But I've met up with a lot of the the guys face to face. As I knew a lot of them through my own friendship groups or work and stuff but there was there's some boys that I'd never met before that have become really good mates which I kind of wasn't that was never like the goal of when I started it but it's really nice to kind of have that and just know that for all of us there's at least somewhere to go to to kind of just spill like where because some people you're not going to you're not going to go want to vent to your, to your missus because sometimes she's the problem <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it's like sometimes you do need to have those conversations but like yeah sometimes you just need a second opinion it's a bit harder if it's your family or like your colleagues so it's just sometimes strangers that you can still kind of consider like your mates that aren't going to judge you because they've done the same thing and there's people with different expertise like there's some scenarios that boys have put in there where I'm like I don't know how to navigate that and then someone else who's maybe a bit older than me or kind of been through that situation like I think like give their a little advice and stuff mm. so it's nice it's, it's just um, it's been fascinating it's just fascinating to see everyone's different perspectives and yeah and, and the common themes that you kind of see in there with why why guys are struggling is it is it the stuff that we've talked about? You know, is it is it relationships? Is it, you know, career prospects? Is it just like a lack of direction and, and support, do you think? Yeah, I think it's the, um, there's a lot of kind of relationship stuff. A big one that um, comes up a, a fair bit is like, um, I think it's really uh, over overlooked is like childcare mm -hmm. and how men get kind of, fucked over in a way from like in, in those kind of situations. Um, so if people are going through like divorces or splits, it's like their the world gets, if they don't have access to their kids as often, they, it really fucks with them, understandably. Um, and yeah, like navigating relationships or like the attachment style stuff, I think is big. And yeah, I think we all, I think everyone struggles with career stuff. I think it's really hard to kind of pinpoint your like, cause there's this whole divine, stuff you see on thing about purpose and stuff like that so you kind of can fall into that that trap but um it's, it is quite broad yeah we had uh we had george from the tin man come on and he was talking about um you know sort of the societal problems with or for men um and one of the things that he mentioned wasn't it about was about access to children um and certainly a lot of the statistics because they're a little bit more accessible come from the us um but he attributed as much as 20 percent of suicides in men yeah we're down to that so yeah i think that's a big problem yeah it's um you know it is i think it is like i said there's always like a, there's always like a, a side of the fence to kind of mm. look at but yeah like you definitely see like the stats kind of speak for themselves in a way isn't it and um for for a lot of men you know they're you know i can't, I can't really speak from my experience i don't have kids but i know it is such a purpose uh, drive and like a, a, a meaning to life and it's like if you don't I don't have that kind of if you have that whipped away from you um, it must be like soul destroying yeah we're, we're both parents yeah. And, and yeah yeah so it's yeah it's, it's 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 nice to kind of see the boys like kind of obviously the the, the, the the group chat can't help anything to do with like that like in terms of like whether it's court related or anything like that but someone to relate to or someone to vent to yeah exactly yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. so it's good uh, is that open to like anybody that wants to join yeah. or how do people find that group if they want to get yeah. involved so we do have a, an insta page um gents who vent and then if you um kind of message me there's like i've got like these house rules that i've devised because when i it was a bit trial and error when i first launched it and it got bigger it was a bit chaotic and obviously i, re I respect people's privacy and you know this you know there's some boys that have come in and you know, it's it's great because some people don't engage at all. Mm. They just sit and they just watch, but they'll still message me and be like, I love the group because it's like you, you're still learning and you're you're kind of seeing people's perspectives and knowing that you're not alone. Some boys kind of only drop in if they've got like their own stuff, which is what it's there for. 
Um, and then there's like a bit more of like a core where they kind of check in with each other like all the time and like a bit more regular, but it's literally there for work when you need it, as you need it, which is the purpose of it. And yeah, Instagram or message me directly. House rules, there's like five set rules about confidentiality and stuff like that. And then, um, yeah, I need, I need kind of like your name and number to know you're real. And, and yeah. <laughs> Yeah, mate, that sounds like a really good group. We'll, we'll put the, um, the details of that down in the description so people can check it out. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about as well was identity because I think a lot of guys lack identity. And I think you're similar to me that once upon a time that you identified as a bit of a fighter. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so tell us about that. How did you end up fighting in a cage? Yeah, it's such a... That's a really... Yeah, the identity is like the perfect, perfect description really because it was like pursuing an... Like, almost like pursuing an identity that wasn't me mm -hmm. in a way. Yeah. So I was um, going through those issues in my, in my teenage years and anger problems and the depression and the grief and stuff like, yeah, my family pushed me towards martial arts as like an outlet and it's kind of stereotypical like direction, but it is like life saving and important. And um, yeah, that kind of, I had this like desire and this push, it was a really good help for me and it was like life changing. And I had this, burning desire in my teens especially after losing like a lot of the male figures around me at the time and uh to be for me to be like accepted was to be hard as fuck <laughs> <laughs> and then i went in and was an mma fighter and got weighed in every fight <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but i yeah i got the shit kicked out of me like most of the fights i had um i had like a amateur record or semi-pro record of like three and five mm -hmm. So yeah, but the, the, it was a massive chapter for me because it was like, it was a good outlet for me. It was discipline. It was building a skill set. But I was kind of, I do think looking back that I was all doing it for the wrong reasons. Mm. Even though it was character development now, um, I spent all that time as trying to build this identity of being a fighter, physical. Whereas actually, if I look back at all my life now, metaphorically, I've always been a fighter through resilience of other stuff and life challenges. Um, so yeah, it was, it was, a, it was a really like amazing chapter. Um, but then just started to see in the results for themselves that like, I probably was doing it for the wrong reasons. I didn't have that spark and fire that you need to be this kind of top athlete that the boys are now and boys and girls mm. are now. What was your, uh, what was your first fight like? Tell us about how that went. How did it feel? <laughs> <laughs> so I was, it was back in 2013. So I was 16. So it's just turned 17 maybe. So my first two fights were rough. So I had a, had a really amateur kind of comic. It's called Ringmasters okay. based in Kent. And um, yeah, I went there and it, it, I remember a clinch of this guy went into a clinch. Didn't know. I was so like the adrenaline dump I'd never felt before. So I come out swinging like lead balloons, <laughs> missed every punch. Like, you know, when you have a nightmare of how you think like when you fight, yeah. it's exactly like I lived it. <laughs> <laughs> it was shit. <laughs> um, missed every punch. And then we kind of clinched up and he judo threw me onto my like head and it made a massive thud and I heard the whole crowd go, ooh. <laughs> I was like, for fuck's sake. And then weirdly, I somehow managed to get the guys back and I had a mental block and I had literally the hooks, I had everything and I just couldn't squeeze. I had like the adrenaline or the mental block. So I lost that fight on points. And then that was embarrassed. That was kind of like, oh. And then my semi-pro like debut about a year later uh, was like at an actual event. So it was like people had paid to come watch proper production, like video cameras, it was on YouTube. I'd watched the promotion for years as like a inspiring like young teenager. And I got the shit kicked out of me. It's on YouTube. You can go laugh at that. <laughs> got my face bounced about. Yeah. yeah, I got like, again, it was like awful stand up from me. And he got me in a clinch and kneed me in the nose three times in a row. Oh. I didn't even stop it. I, was, I had my hands there and it just comes straight up. Kneed me in the nose three times. I'm pretty sure it fractured my nose. Uh, blood everywhere. I went for a takedown, got like manhandled. And he used literally ground and pounded me for about a minute. Just blood everywhere. And my coach <laughs> threw in the towel. Shit. Um, and it was in front of like f hundreds of people. My mum and my brother were there. I was at school at the time. So I was like bragging around thinking I was a bollocks. Like, yeah, I'm an MMA fighter. Next thing you know, a week, like a month later on YouTube, there's me just getting <laughs> weighed in. So it was like really humbling because it was like, uh, as you boys know through jujitsu and stuff, like there was a point where I kind of convinced myself that I was like, yeah, I'm the shit. And then you like, no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think I was just maybe... 
yeah, skill set, confidence and self-esteem was always my barrier. Mm. Always my barrier. It was always mental, mental barriers. Um, and that is because I didn't have that awareness and relationship of identity and myself and that self-development and the self-awareness of my trauma and how I react to things that definitely held me back a lot. So it was a f incredible chapter, like, like once in a lifetime, like mm -hmm. jumped in at 16, jumped out at 21. Mm -hmm. I was an MMA fighter. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. Did you, did you, so you had four wins or five wins? You Three say? wins, five losses in total, like amateur okay. semi pro, yeah. So, what was your, uh, what was your most glorious moment? A big one for me was, uh, I got two wins in a row. That was quite fun. Mm -hmm. I think I, I beat a guy, split decision. I was like 19, he was 30, 31. Um, is it Swanley Leisure Centre? Glamorous life. <laughs> <laughs> I want a split decision and it was all just like me off my back, just submission attacking, which is really, re like you don't see that much in terms of like, you wouldn't never get a nod usually in uh, MMA fight for just being aggressive with attacks, which was a nice feeling because I've, you know, going into the decision, I thought I'd lost it. Um, and then I went and the next fight, I won like a TKO, but that was like a big mental win for me because I just felt like, in a bit of a flow state. I was, and it was the most nervous I'd been that morning was the most nervous I'd been to a fight. And it ended up being my best performance. Um, so it was, it was going into the uh, somewhere, a sport and especially as a competitor in, with such a vulnerable mindset and mentality and frailty, when that's the opposite of what you need to thrive in it was an experience for yeah. sure. Yeah, but with that last win where you kind of found that flow state, I remember I had uh, sort of two MMA fights. Like, I don't know what your semi-pro semi rules were that you fought, but the ones that I fought at the time, which was meant to be semi-pro back in the day, it's like the modern unified amateur rules now, yeah, yeah. but there were no knees to the face, Okay, unfortunately um, for, for me on a, on a couple of positions anyway. <laughs> um, but I remember when I was fighting MMA, I did like an interclub as well, but I don't really count that. But it, it was like, same as you, like crowd, live crowd cameras, being being produced um both of those events beforehand i felt fucking exhausted from managing the emotions yeah yeah like so much so that i had to i, I slept before both my fights really yeah yeah and then when i got in there i was a little bit like i don't know I just dissociated bit, yeah no massively yeah. and i wonder with that last fight that you had i mean I, you can tell me but did you did you find that maybe because you were more nervous, you'd almost allowed, you would embrace your emotions more and that therefore transferred to a bad fight, do you think? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Because the the fights that, um, so I remember one fight in particular where I, it was it was, it was, it was not a great performance at all. Um, obviously I lost, but <laughs> um, I was so caught up in the moment that it like fucked me. So like in my head, he, I didn't see him at the weigh-ins. I didn't, I see him around the venue. So in my head, I convinced myself, I was, oh, he's not here. He's not, he's not going to be fighting. And mm -hmm. I haven't seen him. Like, mm -hmm. oh, okay, I don't have to fight now. And then he turned up and I was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, oh, I've got to fight him. And I was like, oh, shit. And it kind of, yeah, I lost the battle before I got in, I got in there. But that flow state, um, yeah, it's like, you understand that you're anxious, you let it flow and you kind of run with it. And it's like, you just, you're a bit more aware that you are going into a battle. Um, I think it was definitely it um but yeah like you definitely people deal with it in different ways like you don't want to go to you don't want to be near you don't want to be near one of those venue toilets to tell you that an hour before fight time do you because they're <laughs> fucking carnage <laughs> <laughs> and then after you finished when you were 21 so i remember i i stopped fighting because of an injury and that put me in quite a dark place for a period because yeah. i'd lost my identity and had to, to rediscover it in other ways i mean what was what was your exit from fighting like was it a conscious decision or you know, did you did you stop because of an injury? How did you feel emotionally at that point? Yeah, it was it was kind of a bit silly of me in a way because I I I had the two two back to back wins and then I had two back to back losses and then I consciously knew then I was like I don't actually think this is for you anymore. Like I think you know you're training hard. Like I was training four or five days a week. Like I had sponsors. I was like putting in work and I, it's some, it still wasn't clicking. I still wasn't performing the way I could. Um, and I kind of knew that it was like mental barriers and mental health issues and stuff. But like, I remember I dis I stopped for about a year. I just focused on training and competing jujitsu and having a bit of fun. And then I, 2018, I was like, I'm gonna have another MMA fight. And I went in and then again, same mentality, 
same issues, same problem, same result. Got armbarred in 45 seconds. I was like, yeah, fucking call it. See you later. <laughs> <laughs> That's my answer. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then it was after that, it was hard because I, it was, that was 2018. That was when I just finished uni. Um, and that's when all the kind of the proper suicidal streak happened because I I stopped training. I wasn't around my core group. That, that that core that I was training with in Kent, I'd been around those guys and they were like my family for like four or five years. Mm -hmm. And then I was away from them. Mm -hmm. um, wasn't wasn't training. I tried jumping in on a couple of gyms. I tried different sports. I just it wasn't the same. And I'd say I was just super isolated. So yeah, like missing that camaraderie and just the um i neglected and i even up until like when i returned to jiu-jitsu two years ago like i neglected the importance of that feeling of just the training you don't have to be a competitor some people aren't as i say i wasn't really cut out for it but you the importance of the training and the the foundations and the values are still detriment like they're still there you need them um so going back to that it was like and that's why i'm kind of thinking i'm pushing it a bit more this year is because like um, it is. I, I appreciate its importance in my life and the, what it offers. So, it comes in different ways. Yeah, we're we're obviously massive advocates of jujitsu for for mental health as well. We talk about it a lot, and I think you don't need to necessarily compete. But I think what you said there a moment ago about you know having that family, having that camaraderie. Mm -hmm. I think that's there's a, there's a few other things that we've talked about, like CrossFit, obviously military, but mm -hmm. I think jujitsu is one of the, the the kind of unique sports that you can do where actually you, the entry point is is quite low. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of come in from any sort of athletic background, yep. any background at all, and you meet like-minded people on the mat and you do get a good a good sort of, you know, social network as a result. Mm. It's, 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 it's like, fucking hell, I started there. <laughs> um, I turned into that Stormzy meme. <laughs> <laughs> um, like I've played football, rugby, like, like six or seven different sports, but jiu-jitsu is the one where you go into onto the mats and you've got like you got different genders, different job roles, different socioeconomic backgrounds, and everyone it doesn't matter. You're all gonna get smashed, mm -hmm. and it's like and it's, you're gonna get smashed by people you would never expect are gonna smash you. Like, and that was like because when I started when I was 16, like um, yeah, like there was roles where I was like beating up adults at 16 and then there's other situations where now I'm getting beaten up by like young teenagers um, uh, or, or whatever. And it's just like, yeah, like the, the role, there's no role or um, hierarchy as such other than the belts, of course. But like in terms of like the human un in the gi or in the no gi. Even belts are this nomad limit. Go on, go. <laughs> <laughs> but it is... Um, yeah, I think there's, there's no sport like it. And obviously, and again, we, we kind of said there about the different continuums and spectrums. Like there are like the culty elements and then there's the, the just the, the kind of more hobbyist, like social, just the social needs that it can offer people as well, as well as the health benefits is huge. Like I say, I, didn't, I had no, with my dad passing away, my dad's best mate passing away, who was like almost like my second dad passed away in like the same year, a year and a half like not having many like male role models around me, like all of my coaches over the years have been that kind of bit of an anchor for me during different chapters in my life. Um, and I think especially like young men going back to kind of those mental health conversations, like you do need them if you don't have them. Um, so yeah, for me, it was like that, that, that was the values that I valued the most. I quite like the thought that you can go anywhere in the world, just find a jujitsu gym and you're going to make mates. Yeah. yeah. I quite, I love that. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't care about relocating anywhere. Because I would just be like, oh, good jiu -jitsu. And you're going to meet the same sort of lads like us. And yeah. Then you just, yeah, you get mates. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's very true, mate. Gives you mates globally for sure. Mm. Um, the last thing I wanted to chat to you about, mate, when we, we kind of touched on earlier was your sobriety. Mm. Um, how long has it been now? So it's coming up to five months. Nice. That's four and a half. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's something that I've, um, I've talked about before. So I... I think I stopped drinking probably about a year and a half ago now, mm -hmm. but I did have but I did have a drink back in March, so it's been what like ten months, mm -hmm. about ten months, nothing at all. Um, and I've found like a huge change in my outlook, in my mindset. Um, I've said to you loads of times, I don't think I probably would have done this, and I don't think we would have got yeah. so far um, if I was still drinking. Mm -hmm. And now I associate a lot of my recent successes with being sober. 
Um, and I was never like a heavy drinker by any means, but I definitely had some bad drinking habits. Mm-hmm. Like, how have you found the journey? And do you see that as something now that's just behind you? Yeah. So it's, um, congrats as well, by the way. Um, yeah, it was, I kind of always knew I wanted to make the change. So I say my notes in this kind of self reflection few years of journey. I was always writing my notes when I was hungover, like, you need to fucking stop this. I've literally got like paragraphs of like monologue on a hangover being like, you need to stop this because it's fucking doing this and holding you back and you're aware of it, but you're not making the changes. And then, um, so I kind of always knew I had a bit of a, a battle with it and um, used it to kind of mask and like as a bit of direction. And I kind of developed a bit of an identity post fighting as a bit of a party boy. Um, and, it was weird, yeah, like as I've done it, I did a month sober the year before um, just as a, to see how I could do it. And I, I struggled a bit because um, I think what, I think for me, luckily, thankfully, because I was putting in some kind of self-development work over the years and I had a bit of a self-awareness about me, removing the alcohol, it was like, especially this year was fucking hard, but it wasn't a massive shock to the system there was still like identity issues where it's like who the fuck am I about boozing or needing to pre-drink before this or these behaviours triggered and this anxiety but um, yeah I've just lost my child of thought what a dickhead <laughs> <laughs> yeah so you're just talking about your identity and drinking how you yeah oh yeah the, the, the cushion the blow because people that um, would just haven't done that kind of awareness like, that aren't aware of themselves once they do it it is fucking terrifying to look in the mirror and be like who are you without this like substance to mask it um and i definitely in my first month first two three months this year or last year that's kind of what i hit, hit a bit of mm. and it was like depressing as fuck because you're like almost like reinventing yourself because you're going to lose a lot of the people you've been around your your hobbies and your interests change um yeah your lifestyle fucking changes and i think the kind of helpful thing for me with the self-employment at the same time was like, that's what my focus then became. When I was getting this recharge of energy and I wasn't hung over all the time and I was sleeping better, I could then put my my, my energy and my focus onto the self-employment stuff. And then it's probably similar to you of this project and, and stuff like that. It's- How often were you drinking? <laughs> what were you drinking? Was you drinking every night? Or was no, you drinking was like, like so was it just a binge weekend all the time? And then like f- three days recovery? And three, probably three, four days a week. Um, I was, but the, the, what I realized in my relationship with kind of alcohol and drugs was like once I start, I don't I didn't stop. <laughs> um, my problem, my problem. So I'd like yeah. have I, I can go to the pub for one or two beers. Like if I come out at eight or nine o'clock, I'm usually going to be out to at least two or three. Doesn't matter if it's work the next day, kind of thing. I can't really say no. And in my head, I had built this narrative like, oh, yeah, it'll be a story. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I was like, yeah, it is, but also you're fucking making a mess of stuff. So it was like that glamification in my own head at the time. It was like, it's not kind of what it seemed. And um, little things that I learned afterwards where people would like make comments to me, and like, oh, yeah, like, so there was a habit that I thought was like a little bit of self care, and it was the fucking opposite. I live above a restaurant and I'd go down, I'm friends with them that own it. I'd go down for like, if I didn't have any plans, I'd just go down there for like four or five beers, have a chat with the staff and like, and then I would go upstairs and I'd just like tank a bottle of red wine on my own <laughs> in the living room. I was just like, yeah, in my head I was like, oh, this is like my favorite way to spend a Friday evening. It's like, and then I was like, actually that's, there's some issues there, bro. <laughs> like, <yeah. laughs> and I was like, but at the time, at least at the time, I was like, fucking hell, life is so great. Like, I'm such a self like self dependent person. I was like, no. Nah, and my friends started saying that to me out loud. I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then one of my friends was like, yeah, once you started, like you would never stop, would you? And I was like, oh, yeah. And, like, <laughs> and, it's, and then he would like, like, do you need to go out again tonight? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And just make up excuses. And it was just like, what am I running away from? Yeah. Like, why do I need this? Like, what are you? I think it's culture, mate. Yeah, I it honestly, is. I think it's culture. It's British culture. That that whole weekend going out on the piss. I know I've lost, not lost friends. I wouldn't say that, but we've definitely, our friendship group has grown apart yeah. because we do not go out on the piss. In my 20s, that's all we've done. Played football, yeah. went out on the piss. Played football, went out on the piss. We've done that for, about hot, for fucking 15 years. Mm. And then as soon as that's all stopped, it's like, fuck, what really have we got in common? Yeah, that's A few of us one. are still like keeping in touch and we have got still stuff in common and we're still friends. Yeah. But 
when you have kids and life changes and whatever else, you think, fucking hell, why did I do it for so long? Yeah. Because I did. I felt like shit my whole 20s. Yeah. You know what I mean? You just, you like you said, you drink on a weekend and it would. It would be the same with me. You'd go out on a Friday sometimes. I'd turn up to football hungover, go out Saturday night. Sunday then I'm a fucking wreck. You know what yeah. I mean? I'd pick up my boy in the morning. I would go and be a, still a dad all day. I'd be hanging out my yeah, ass. So like, yeah. And then Monday still shit Tuesday I feel alright by Wednesday by Friday again I was fucking drinking yeah I think you're right there's definitely a culture too I think that's going a little bit but a lot of what you just said then makes sound so familiar I had very similar behaviours exactly the same once I started and stop um, and the other thing when I really sort of I guess the light bulb moment for me was was the same thing with, with you just said there mate where I was drinking alone a lot yeah. so it wasn't even about going out and socialising it wasn't a culture thing so I sat doing it my I fucking, fucking hated drinking <laughs> do you know what I mean that's yeah. I don't know if that's worse I hate it the whole time I drank yeah I never like I never had a, like a joy a, a joy of drinking yeah. I was I was I was the opposite you mm. know what I mean like you were, oh yeah you were doing like the social I don't know element. if that's worse you know what I mean because I actually never enjoyed it no I don't think so mate because I think when it comes to the point to stop it's far easier yeah yeah you, yeah, yeah and, and you probably yeah. were similar mate I think I, I listened to uh, I think it was Andrew Huberman podcast where he was talking about how some people have like an opiate effect of drinking and they're typically the sorts who just yeah. keep going after it and never I stop. You said that it's like a lower threshold, isn't it? So yeah. You, like basically, you get the feeling of feeling tipsy very early. Yeah, I get, but I get instantly buzzed. Yeah, I don't get that. I, I'll, I'll do a, I'll, I'll do like a, a, a glass of wine. Yeah, like pretty quick. Yeah, and it's like I've done a line of coke. Oh really? Like I get yeah. Buzzed off it, and I found that a lot, and and that resulted in me. Like I'd come home from work and I'd pass the shop and I'd be like, ah. yeah, you know, yeah, dopamine like fluttering. Yeah. Like, you go, son, go and get a bottle of wine. Yeah. So I was the same man. And you you mentioned about that sort of discovery with it. I, I spoke to somebody a while back who I think had maybe stopped drinking as well. And they said that them stopping drinking was a journey. And I said that I actually found stopping drinking once I got past the first, certainly the first four or six weeks, mm. I found actually take the like, drinking, not drinking. I found that really easy. The journey for me, and you said this a second ago as well, is it's it's rediscovering like my capability sober. Mm-hmm. So it, there's certain situations where I would have a pre-drink yeah. and I'd do it a little bit tipsy and I'd get that confidence and social lubricant. Mm-hmm. And now the journey that I'm on is like actually putting myself in social situations or scary situations like sober. It's fucking, that's, that was definitely like the, and like when I drink or if I'm like coked up, <laughs> my, like, I'm already quite, I can be, especially with the mood is sort of like pretty extroverted. Yeah. So when I'm on that, <laughs> fuck me. Like I feel sorry for You're some of the people's in. kitchens I was in. Yeah. Cause I was putting damage on the cupboards with how much I was talking. Like it was bad. Like really like looking back now, like at the time I was like, I remember always my narrative, like it's all about balance. It's all about a story. It's all about living. And then like, when you actually look at the damage, it's like actually doing and like the, especially with like, so for bipolar, like drinking is like the number and drugs, it's not, it's not it's no go. <laughs> and I was just like, it's like putting petrol on a fire and I was doing it all the time. So it was just like ca- catastrophes. But yeah, like that kind of extroversion, like, and then without it, like you say, going into, especially like if it was like dating or like, I don't know, public speaking or um, if I was DJing, it's like, you, yeah, the little bit of booze or something before mm. it's like, loosens you up now it's like no you actually have the confidence now in yourself to actually go and do it and carry yourself and it's you carrying yourself now mm. you don't have the substance to kind of use the mask and to hold you up yeah and, that, and this is something that i thought about as well because when you're you know again i was similar in the sense that if i had a few drinks far more extroverted whereas i think sober i'm actually quite introverted i'm social but i'm quite introverted and i'm often like a reflector so i'll sit quietly in a conversation especially a new group of people and which observe and then gradually warm up to them and start being more open with my personality but drinking it was a boom straight yeah, in all life the time party, kind of in the circle yeah 100 percent, mate and with like djing and stuff how did you find how did you find that like sober you still do much of that yeah so it's it's definitely like harder because i think if I'm DJing with, um, so I, as you've probably learned, I'm in my head, own head a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, so when I'm like DJing and I, if I've had a few drinks, it's like you're you're a bit more like risky. You're like I don't care if I fuck this transition up because I'm just you're enjoying. More in the moment. Yeah, you're more in the moment yeah. and you're kind of just in a bit of a flow, um, which you can kind of understand why it's like so prom- prominent in the industry, sadly. But then. Um, yeah if I'm sober it takes me a little bit longer I, you still find that flow but it takes you a bit longer like maybe two or three transition for you just warm up into it and kind of find the shakes to stop and stuff like um, 
but it's yeah all, there's so many different social situations where I just wasn't expecting didn't realise how much alcohol affected like life I have was, you lost a lot of friends since <laughs> I'd say, do you know what's really, I'm really grateful for is not my core friends. Yeah. Because they understood I had a bit of a battle with it and they um, kind of, that year, that month I did sober last year, they were kind of amongst that support group as well. Um, so they're very supportive, but yeah, I've lost a lot of acquaintances, yeah. a lot of people on my phone that I'd like. Yeah, but I think the thing is, we, you find this in life, don't you? Have you, you have a, a small core group of friends who you connect with on a much deeper level, yeah. and then you've just got, as you say, associates or people that you have common ground with. Yeah. So you know, we've got mates at jujitsu that we hang out with and get on with when we're at jujitsu. But mm -hmm. if we stop doing jujitsu, you'd never speak to them again. Mm. And I think you get that with drinking yeah. as well. And it's quite a natural m m movement, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. You can't be. You can't have a a good relationship with everyone can no. you, you know what I mean because it, it's just impossible yeah. you can't put that time in that effort you know you don't want to yeah. let alone fucking it's know. the same with um, I've had it with with jobs like it's, it's quite like anything where there's a change you're going to have it like I've, I've there are people I used to work with who I've had like considered like friends and then now it's like don't ever mm -hmm. everyone's kind of cracks on their own thing and that's just part of the life of the chapters and obviously yeah. life is chapters and yeah. it changes a lot doesn't yeah. it you know there's people at, when I used to work with Paul at Nuffield there was loads of people I really liked there and there's probably only two that I keep in touch with and it's not because I don't like the other people yeah. that I don't. It's just I can't keep in touch with 10 other PTs that I was quite friendly with at the time. Yeah. just can't. It's just, yeah. It just doesn't happen. They move on, we move on. Yeah, 100%. Mate. But I think it's quite an exciting journey going sober, mate. I think it's that, that journey of like discovery and, you know, like, I think when you are in those social situations and you're you're kind of speaking in a certain way, you know, it's still you articulating those words and it's still you pulling that energy mm -hmm. from somewhere. And I think the excitement in the journey is trying to sort of grow as a person mm -hmm. and develop those that same enthusiasm, that same level of, you know, speaking and engagement with people sober. Mm -hmm. So that's quite an interesting kind of journey trying to get to that point, I think. Definitely. It's interesting to see how far you can go. Yeah. yeah. Like that's sober. the part of me now. Do you know now. what I mean? Like how far can you actually go when you put your mind to it? Yeah. yeah. And that competitiveness in you, like now I've done nearly five months, I'm like, I want to get to six months. Yeah. And then I'm going to be like, no, I want to get to a year. And, yeah. then, and once you've done, like, so when I did that month sober, then I went back onto the booze, it was like even more catastrophic because I'd, like, I'd been away from it and I went extra hard. Whereas <laughs> yeah. now it's like almost a bit of fear of like, well, once you start drinking again, you're going to be worse. But that competitiveness of like, yeah, I want to outdo myself and prove myself right. And Yeah, just in life though, isn't it? Yeah. Like how far can you go yeah. without drinking? You know, you, you see all these successful people and none of them are alcoholics. Or As drink. In, uh, well, yeah. unless they're like actors or something. And they just <laughs> fucking make loads of money and then they, then they become alcoholics. Yeah. But I mean, someone coming from nothing and making themselves successful, they can't do it with a, with a drug a or a drink addiction. And without it, you can achieve whatever the fuck you want. And I know it's hard to get there. And I know that everyone has like, again, a spectrum of like addiction and like mental health issues. But I feel like no one's like, like someone, people reach out to me now all the time because like, they see, because I'm honest about it on my Insta and stuff. People always come to me and like ask for like advice and stuff. And I'm like, the main thing, like takeaway is like, I don't know anyone, anyone's life that's got worse by going sober. Mm. That's a great point, 100%. No, like if you look at anyone that's gone sober, look at their life and like, has it dipped or is it kind of stay? It might stay, like it will always go up yeah. at least a little bit. Um, but I feel like there's no, uh, especially with like the recent success I've found over the last kind of like six, like since I've gone sober, the paths are running parallel. And I don't think there's any, any kind of uh, coincidence in that. Yeah, I found that as well. And, and now I'm at a point where I attribute a lot, so much success to being sober mm. that I just, I don't want to go back yeah. because I feel like, like you mentioned it a second ago, I'd, I'd be worried that I don't do a lot of that good work. Mm -hmm. And when I started, when I first started not drinking, it was never like a life lifetime thing in my head. It was like, oh, I'll drink at some point, but yeah, it's not yeah. for a bit. But now I've got to a point where I'm like, oh, I don't know. Maybe, don't it, yeah. maybe I won't ever again. That's quite a powerful, like a self-empowering feeling to be in as well because you were in control again. Yeah. So it's nice. I could quite happily not drink again. Yeah, mm. you're a big drinker anyway, no, mate. that's what I mean. Like I just, yeah. I just you, you don't have to curse your relationship with uh, Yeah, it. I'm just fairly, <laughs> fairly lucky with that. Like I just don't think I've got that type of yeah. personality. And, and the thing that I found as well that I've mentioned to you before is because I've continued to drink alcohol-free beer. Yeah. I've got, I've got like um, a taste for that now. And when I've had, there was an occasion we went out for a bite to eat and they brought out um, an alcoholic beer when I asked for an alcohol-free one. 
and I had a little taste, mate. I was like, <laughs> fucking hell. Oh, really? Yeah. Mate, yeah. The, 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 this, and, and, and for me, this is my body got to be telling me it's poison. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's fucking foul, mate. Now, I could never taste the alcohol before. Yeah, yeah. But now I can, and it's foul, mate. And it, when people say, oh, would you maybe just have one? I'm like, no, because it tastes like shit yeah. now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, it absolutely tastes like shit. It's like shit. when you change, <laughs> it's, a, it's a weird comparison, but I remember I used to, when I was growing up, always drink Coca Cola. Mm. And then as I got like 15, 16, I switched to Diet Coke. And you know that first two weeks, you're like, this tastes like shit. And then you go back <laughs> to an original Coke, and you're like, I can't drink it ever again. Yeah, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? You, ch- it, you like taste buds change, and then yeah. you sense it, and you can. Uh, can you drink full f- like yeah, fat, sh- sugary drinks now? I I can't. I just I, I literally can't do it. I'm like, feel it stick into your veins. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah like, I just fucking hate the taste of it. I think it's syrupy and shit. You know what I mean? I can even taste it if I had like a like a vodka and coke, and it's like a bold coke or like. I had that of um secondhand smoke in my family home like my mum was a chain smoker like and I everyone would always come to me like do you smoke because they could smell it I could never smell it and as soon as I moved out and I went back I could smell it yeah. your, smell senses, it, yeah. Are, your yeah. senses are fucking crazy man it's fascinating isn't it yeah mate but no, no well done mate but yeah keep up keep up the journey man it's awesome mate I think we're about done anything you want to kind of shout out or uh, do you want to tell people where to find you yeah cool so um, first of all thank you for having me it's been great it's been, I think we've covered loads there haven't we yeah, it's good. <laughs> yeah, I really enjoyed that um, but um, yeah catch me on Instagram and TikTok as Mersey M-A-I-R-S-Y-Y I need to put my own name quality um, and yeah just I don't know keep going <laughs> so yeah. people are listening there's going to be a lot of people I think we covered so much that is really relatable there but you know life is beautiful sometimes you just got to clean the lens from time to time and change the lens so Keep going, but yeah, appreciate you listening. Awesome, thanks for going on, brother. Thank, Thank you. you, mate. Cheers. Cheers, mate. Thank you.